All right, thank you very much. And hello again, dear radio friends. How in the world are you? Doing all right today? Yes, that little greeting establishes the fact that this is indeed your friend, Dr. Cook, and I'm glad to be back with you to look at the Word of God and then try to put a handle on it so that you can get hold of it for yourself. God's inerrant Word is forever true whether or not anyone reads or believes it. Paul says, let God be true even though every man is found a liar. But God's word becomes of value to you and to me when we apply it to our lives. And my purpose then is to make the truth so plain that you can get hold of it and say, that's for me. I'm going to apply that to my life today. I've just been praying that God's Holy Spirit would put his truth and his love and his blessing and his compassion and his power into the things that we say to each other in these next few moments. May God grant it for his own glory. Well, you and I are looking at Mark chapter 6. The Lord Jesus has just completed the feeding of 5,000 men, and that is, as it says in another gospel, besides women and children. Now it says straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee before him, unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. Small thought here. The disciples had been eager for the benediction, but they missed it now. And God has a way of saying, look, you didn't want it, so now you're not going to get it. And that isn't because he's captious or, or uh, uh, whimsical or irrational. It is because God wants us to learn the lessons that have to do with walking closely and humbly with him. You recall that some hours before they had said, send the, uh, send them away, send them away, that they may go into the country round about, and so on. He said, well, it's your responsibility. You give them some deed. They said, why, you want us to go and buy 200 days wages worth of, of bread? Is that what you want? They were a little bit put out about the matter, I'm sure, at that point. For here's the, here's the procedure, and once you learn it, you'll learn to look for it and, and avoid it. When you get burdened for your own convenience, the next thing that happens is irritation with other people's needs. When you get burdened for your own convenience, the next thing that happens is irritation with other people's needs. Why does he have to bother me? Why does it have to happen now? I once heard a widow lady whose husband had passed away suddenly. She said, why did he have to go and die now? <laughs> well, I don't think he planned it. <laughs> no one ever does. But from, uh, from preoccupation with your own convenience comes irritation with other people's needs. And so they had said, hey, you want us to spend 200 days wages? We haven't got that much anyway. But that's what it would cost to feed this crowd. Well, you remember the rest of the story. Our Lord Jesus took what they had, he multiplied it, and gave it back to them to give out to others. And there was enough left over for one basket of fragments for each of the apostles. Interestingly enough, there were 12 apostles and 12 baskets of fragments. Jesus didn't have a basket left for him. I wonder if anybody thought about that. Maybe they did. So anyway, it says, he said, you get in the boat and go on over across the Sea of Galilee. I'll, I'll send the crowd away. They wanted the benediction, but when it came time for the parting blessing, he said, go ahead, you go on now. You wanted to leave? Go ahead, leave. Beware of the desire to serve your own comfort and convenience. Beware of the desire to serve your own comfort and convenience. It will cost you the blessing of the Lord at some point or other. Will you remember that, beloved? So it says, When he had sent the crowd away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Another small thought here. We need to learn to pray after ministry as well as before it. I find myself praying earnestly before I have to preach a sermon. Because I'm burdened to know for sure that God's anointing is upon me and that I have in mind clearly what it is that I'm to say, I want to be uh, emotionally uh, charged up and, and, and properly ready for the 
ministry of the Word of God. Every pastor, every evangelist, every missionary knows about this. You pray, oh God, anoint me, give me your Holy Spirit in power now. I know he dwells within me. Now I want him to anoint me and, and fill every part of my life so I can preach with power. Oh, how you pray. I don't find so many people praying right after they preach. As a matter of fact, I myself have uh, had to remind myself many a time, Cook, you better pray now as well as you prayed before. Why? Because after you've ministered, you become vulnerable to the attacks of Satan in a way that you weren't before. Elijah, I suppose, is the classic example of this. He was able to gather all Israel to, to Mount uh, Carmel. He was able to lay down that, that tremendous challenge to the priests of the false idol and say, now you, you, uh, you put your sacrifice on the, on the altar and then you call on your God and the God that answers by fire. Let him be the God. I will submit to you that Elijah the prophet had no proof that Almighty God would answer him either. This was, a, this was a step of faith on his part, and it took some courage to do it, didn't it? His life was at stake at that point, as well as the history and the future of, of Israel. But uh, no, he was up to it, and, and the day wore on. He even was, was able to muster a little sarcasm as he said to them, you better pray louder. Maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe your God has gone on a journey or he's taking a nap. You better pray a little louder. You know, he, he wasn't above uh, giving them a little jibe now and then. Now comes the time for the evening sacrifice, which would be about 3 p.m., and he pours the water, a very scarce commodity. You will have to remember there had been three years of drought, and this was a mountaintop. Where they got it, I don't know. But there was enough water to, to drench the sacrifice and the altar and then to fill a trough that had been dug round about those stones that formed the rude altar. So it was thoroughly drenched. Nobody was going to say that it was in spontaneous combustion that day. And then he prayed, he said, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that thou art God. And the fire came and it consumed the sacrifice and the altar and licked up the water that was in the trench. Well, the people were convinced. Elijah was up to that. And then there was the execution of these false prophets who had led a whole nation into dreadful sin. And after that, there was the praying for the rain Elijah prayed until his servant said, There ariseth out of the sea a small cloud like a little like a, a little cloud like a man's hand. Elijah said, That's it. Go tell the king, hurry up, it's going to rain. And in the meanwhile it said the heavens were black with clouds, and the rain came, and Elijah ran in front of the king in front, that is, of the king's chariot. Twenty some miles. I, I measured it on the map in the back of my Bible. It looks to me like about twenty seven miles. That's the world's first marathon run. And he ran in front of the king's chariot back to the nearest town there. And when he got to town, the message then awaited him. Your head is going to be taken off by tomorrow morning. And he got immediately upset and ran for his life. He was vulnerable after the victory. That's the point I'm making. Will you, my beloved pastor and Sunday school teacher and missionary and evangelist, and just like the rest of us garden variety Christians, shall we learn to pray after ministry as well as before? Jesus did. He departed, it said, into a mountain to pray, and he was there alone. Nobody praying with him. He was just alone with his Father. You and I need to take the time to get alone with God after we've ministered, after we've preached, after we've taught that Sunday school lesson, after we've counseled with our family on some matter, after we've witnessed to someone about the Lord Jesus Christ, take a moment to pray and seek God after your ministry as well as before. Good idea? Well, it said, uh, when the even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land, and he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. You couldn't set the sail because the wind was blowing the wrong direction. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed he had been a spirit, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. Immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. He went up unto them into the ship. The wind ceased. They were sore amazed. Well, we get to that in a moment. Back now to the verse. It said, He saw them toiling and rowing. 
it's human to say, where is God when I need him? And I'm sure that uh, some thought such as that must have crossed their minds. As there in the midst of the sea, in the middle of the night, they uh, see the, the watches of the, of the day and of the night are, are uh, calculated by hours. And the night began at 6 p.m., so the fourth watch of the night, as I understand it, you scholars can correct me if you wish, would have been around 10 o'clock at night. And so uh, there it was, dark, pitch dark, no navigational line, lights, the winds blowing hard right against them, and they had to row for it. Now it was a good-sized boat and big enough to hold 12 people and their gear, and so uh, it, was a, it was a task. They weren't getting very far. And I'm sure someone must have said, well, I wish he were here. Why, why does he send us away? I wish he were here. Where is God when I need him? That's the question that comes up in people's minds. Your tears are flowing. Your heart is breaking. The burden is heavy. Things are going into reverse. Somebody has hurt you deeply, and you, you just can't cope with it. Your job may be at stake. Your health may be failing, or all of the above, you know. Life has a way of giving you troubles in clusters, doesn't it? The insurance people say that accidents happen in clusters. Well, anybody that's lived a while knows that troubles happen in bunches too, don't they? And so it's just about to plow you under. Oh, you're just so down because everything seems to be going wrong. You don't know what to do about it. And you say, where is God when I need him? Well, he's there. It said he saw them and he went to them and he spoke with them. And he went up unto them into the ship. Hey, God hasn't forgotten, beloved. He hasn't forgotten you. He knows about you. He knows all about you. The psalmist says, Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising, and thou art acquainted with all my thoughts. There is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain unto it. Yes, God knows. He saw them, and he went to them, and he spoke to them, and he came up into the ship. Would you give God a chance to do that for you in these times when you're so heavily burdened? Look for his presence. Look for his word of cheer. Look for his touch upon your life, because it most surely will come. Yes, it will. He hasn't forgotten you. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Dear Father, today, help us to trust the Christ who always shows up when we need him. Amen. Till I meet you once again by way of radio, walk with the King today and be a blessing. You've just heard Walk with the King, the ministry of Dr. Robert A. Cook. This program is listener supported. For more information or to find out how you can help to continue this ministry, write to us at Walk with the King, P.O. Box 43, Trumbull, Connecticut, 06611. Or visit us on the web at walkwiththeking.org. Thank you for your support of this ministry. This has been broadcast number 6426. Thank you for listening to Walk with the King.